Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the time zone uh, in which you are watching us. Uh, and I understand that there are many of these uh, different time zones. Uh, welcome to, to this event, which is hosted by, by FANGDA and DELOS Dispute Resolution in the context of the DELOS Guide to Arbitration Places. Uh, my name is Thomas Granier. I'm an arbitration lawyer practicing at Asafo & Co, a Pan-African firm um, in, um, having um, 150 lawyers throughout Africa, and I'm happy to be here today uh, in my capacity as co-editor of the Delos Guide to Arbitration Places. That's the Delos Gap. Um, a few words about Delos. Uh, as many of you know, Delos Dispute Resolution is a very dynamic arbitral institution, which is chaired by my colleague and friend Hafez Virji. Um, but Delos is not only an arbitral uh, institution. Uh, it is also a knowledge sharing platform. Um, and in addition to the numerous events that it hosts, you will find on its website, the Delos Guide to Arbitration Places, which provides online practical overviews of arbitration laws in uh, 60 uh, jurisdictions in a very user-friendly format, thanks to all the contributing firms, including in particular, Fangda. Um, and um, so we're currently preparing the second edition, which uh, will be published in, in 2021 with an increasing number of chapters for existing and, and new uh, jurisdictions. So watch your emails. Um, and now moving on to today's uh, discussion with our panelists. Um, as you know, the, the topic is uh, the, the often underestimated value of African seats for Chinese and African disputes. And um, we, we, we deliberately decided uh, to adopt a not entirely focused arbitration perspective, but rather to adopt a 360 degree uh, uh, view of this topic. And we'll combine the skills and knowledge of, of arbitration lawyers, uh, including on the council side and the institutional uh, side, but also that of a project lawyer advising Chinese investors in relation to projects in Africa. And we will delve into the mindset of investors and understand uh, whether and if so why African seats may be underestimated before engaging at the end of this panel into a battle of the seats. Um, and I will co-moderate this event with uh, Professor Andrew Scudder. Um, so Andrew uh, is a partner uh, at FANGDA. He's a dispute resolution and competition litigation specialist. His primary practice include uh, commercial and antitrust and arbitration, as well as the, the provision of behavioral and transactional uh, advice to multinational clients. He has extensive experience acting uh, in complex commercial disputes, whether uh, before arbitral tribunals or before the English or uh, Hong Kong courts. Um, uh, he uh, is a professor, he's qualified as a solicitor in England and Wales, and he's currently an associate professor of law at Middlesex University in Mauritius. And with this, I will pass on the floor to Andrew, uh, who will introduce our great panelists today. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and thank you for that introduction, but perhaps I can pass the accolades forward to our amazing panel that we have lined up for you today. As Thomas said, it's, we've, we've gone for a broad spread of expertise and backgrounds and specialisms to try and bring different angles and um, opinions to the debate. So we start um, on the ground with, with uh, two of our panelists actually in Africa dealing uh, with uh, arbitration every day. So firstly, we have Julia Lou, who's an attorney of the High Court of South Africa and a sworn translator of the High Court as well. Um, she's a registrar of the International Division of the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa and Secretary General of the China-African Joint Arbitration Johannesburg Center. She's the first and so far the only female uh, mainland Chinese attorney in South Africa. She specializes in contract law, corporate law, cross-border transactions, commercial litigation and dispute resolution. She and her team have represented various Chinese companies, organizations, and individuals in litigation and dispute resolution in South Africa. 
before practicing law, uh, Julia had over 20 years of working experience in the hospitality industry, venture capital, and business consultancy in both China and South Africa. So she brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the table today. Secondly, we have Baba Tundur Fagbohanu. Um, he's a senior advocate of Nigeria in, and a partner and head of disputes practice at the Luko and Oyabode. He regularly acts as counsel to Nigerian as well as foreign and multinational clients in ad hoc and institutional arbitrations and has several served as an arbitrator in several cases, including arbitrations administered by the ICC and LCIA. He has served as a member of the LCIA Court of Arbitration and serves on the board of directors of the Lagos Chamber of Commercial International Arbitration Center, the LASIAC. Um, he's also recently authored the book, Arbitration in Africa, a review of key jurisdictions, um, published by Sweden Maxwell in 2016. So again, a key expert in helping us unravel the, the, the difference between the African jurisdictions today and their attractiveness as arbitral seats. Then moving to the other side of the table, um, we have the transactional and arbitration lawyers from China and Hong Kong. Uh, firstly, we're joined by Michael Tam, who's a partner with the projects and finance department of Fangda and is focused on advising Chinese sponsors in offshore energy and infrastructure projects. Prior to joining Fangda, Michael and his team work for UK Magic Circle law firms, advising foreign investors in onshore energy and infrastructure investments in China. So we're very happy to have Michael with us today. And last but by no means least is Olga Boltenko. Uh, she's also a partner with me in Fangda Partners in our disputes uh, resolution department. Her practice focuses on investment protection and investor state arbitration. Prior to joining us at Fangda, Olga was the legal counsel at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, and she practiced investment arbitration with major law firms in Paris and Singapore. So again, can bring a different and unique insight to our discussion today. So without further ado, perhaps I, I can kick off that discussion and, and ask the, <laughs> the eternal question, why are we here? Um, it's clear that uh, Chinese investment is becoming ever more prevalent, a uh, fact of life across Africa. Um, so perhaps we could start with you, Michael and Olga. As counsel for Chinese clients in this area, uh, could you give us your observations on the motivations for investment and the concerns that Chinese investors are thinking about when they take that decision to, to invest into Africa? Perhaps start with you, Michael. Okay, thanks for that introduction, Andrew. So, um, as Andrew has introduced, I'm the odd one out here amongst the panelists. I'm the only transaction lawyer here. So I'm asked to actually share some of my experience um, in having, you know, acted for uh, a lot of Chinese sponsors in doing OBOL projects. I think one key aspect I'm trying to actually shine some thoughts on uh, is uh, what may be actually going through the minds of Chinese sponsors at the time of negotiating your project documents um, in coming to a decision on the arbitration uh, forum and dispute resolution forum. So to answer that, I think uh, we need to go back to step one of the processes. We may want to actually look at the originating process, uh, how these uh, overall projects, as we call them, uh, normally come to the hands of Chinese sponsors. And I would say that there are probably two uh, general categories of it. And uh, the difference between them is uh, market in terms of the risk management uh, uh, strategy adopted by Chinese investors and how it actually affects their uh, the risk exposure in this type of projects and how they actually look at uh, arbitration at the end of the process um, if there is any dispute arising from this documentation. Uh, most commonly seen type is, of course, the host government actually put up uh, an open tender to invite uh, international bidders to participate in the bidding process. A lot of this, uh, you know, would come with, I would say all of them actually in an open bidding situation will come with uh, doc, uh, project documentation already prepared by the government. And in most cases here, these are prepared to international standard and what you call to be bankable uh, documents by international project finance on limited recourse finance basis. These type of documents are normally quite fairly and evenly handed drafted. Uh, they're fair to both parties, at least um, on the legal in the legal sense of it. But in terms of commercial terms, uh, devil, you know, uh, the, the devil is the details, and you know, 
um, if you do not understand how these project documents work in terms of passing on risk uh, on a back-to-back -back basis, then you actually miss on it. So um, in terms of projects where the Chinese participants uh, enter into these projects via the uh, open tender uh, bidding process, the documentation are mostly okay. So where disputes normally arise is less about where the documents are incomplete and give rise to uncertainties in the contracts. It's most likely uh, where disputes arise is due to the non-performance. And um, if you're talking about where the Chinese sponsor initiates um, uh, an arbitration process or legal proceeding, it's most likely to do with uh, the other party, and in a lot of these cases, it would be the host government or an entity under the host government uh, not performing their obligations. And what are the most likely categories of non-performance that will end up in uh, the dispute resolution acting in both? Um, bearing in mind that not all disputes actually end up in arbitration. And I would say that the main categories where these sort of things happen would be one, expropriation or uh, sort of behavior that is interpreted by the Chinese sponsors as being an expropriating uh, event. And the other one uh, would be a change in regime. Um, or uh, in some cases here, it would be a non-performance under the concession. Say, for example, there is an undertaking not to uh, change in uh, law, or if there's a change in law, the old law would uh, apply. And uh, sometimes we see that new taxes being imposed, new stamp duties being imposed, new law being imposed, and affects the financial uh, viability of the project. So I would consider that for those type of projects that are um, commenced by an open tender situation, the most likely situation where arbitration or dispute resolution procedures are being invoked are those that involve non-performance by the host government or uh, the, the, the entity on the other side, and most likely to have something to do with the concession or to do with expropriation or change in regime, that type of um, events. And how that actually dictates the uh, choice of uh, jurisdiction uh, issue you know, with arbitration forum. Um, and I would say, largely, if you have been exposed to that type of bad experience in the past there, you would be a bit more skeptical as a Chinese sponsor uh, to agree to a forum that is more close to the host jurisdiction. And that's why, um, and it, this is actually from my experience, other people's experience may be, may, may be different. In our type of negotiations, very often you would find that um, very difficult to convince the Chinese sponsor to adopt uh, 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 arbitration dispute resolution regime that's too far away from home. And if you have to tier what would be considered as being most acceptable to the Chinese sponsor, it would be probably, uh, number one would be Hong Kong, the other one would be Singapore. And from that point onwards, uh, they would accept some other uh, forums that they would consider as being very neutral, uh, like the LCIA. Uh, so, in terms of preference, those would be top three preference. And then a very distant fourth would be uh, other type of forums, especially those that are actually close to the host jurisdiction. So that's basically the mentality of it. Now, just to complete this picture, I just now I talked about, you know, the originating process, one that starts with the open tender. Another feature that uh, is worth exploring is that our um, overall projects inherently more risky and more likely to give rise to uh, disputes. And to some extent, I'd say yes. And there are two reasons for it. One is, I think, host jurisdiction specific. The other one is uh, self-inflicted, what I call. Host jurisdiction specific, um, again, you imagine an open tender situation here. Again, in my experience, a lot of these over projects, why they end up in the Chinese investors' hands is because um, the Chinese sponsors come up with the best bid. And why do they come up with the best base in terms of the amount that they're willing to pay? You know, it could be cheaper than the others or because of the, some of the terms they're willing to accept is that not all Chinese investments are driven entirely by economic considerations. Some of them are actually driven by policies concerns. And what are the, these types of policy concerns? Um, it could be uh, as a matter of policy and China wants to develop a long-term relationship with another country, they see the profit as actually coming from 20, 30 years of cooperation and not just on the financial viability of one project here. Now, this type of projects, if you look at it purely from a 
bankability perspective, they may not actually satisfy international bank, but it may actually satisfy the Chinese banks simply because of the way that these projects are being financed. Um, and so these are being financed a lot of times by uh, parent guaranteed, um, bank, parent back guarantee financing by the Chinese banks there. And so that's why the risk management protocol is very different from international investors. That's why some of the projects uh, which inherently they are not very bankable because of either government credit worthiness issues. Uh, sometimes it could be because of the uh, foreign exchange convertibility issues, and sometimes even uh, you know uh, experience or history of expropriation for a variety of reasons. Here, Chinese sponsors sometimes win projects that other international investors simply cannot. Uh, compete in terms of price or in terms of the terms that they are willing to sign up to. So yes, certain over projects are more risk, um, uh, more risky to begin with. And the second aim of uh, arm of that is actually whether they're self-inflicted, self-inflicted in the sense of um, they take a less prudent risk management approach uh, simply because it's parent-backed guarantee. So the banks. Uh, may not actually look at it with the same pair of careful eyes on each of the conditions, especially in relation to cash flow, protection of cash flow, as you would in an international project finance situation. So those are the sort of issues that make Chinese investment projects more likely to give rise to disputes. But not all disputes, I must stress, actually give rise to um, litigation and uh, goes to arbitration because some of them, Chinese investors simply have to accept that bad luck, you know, sign a document that's already provided for it. And there is a solution inside the agreement. There's probably nothing much to dispute about. It's self-inflicted type of risk there. So in summary, I mean, that's basically, uh, I hope that, that that is a good launching point uh, to with this discussion to look behind some of the mentality between, behind a Chinese sponsor uh, when it comes to the question of actually considering uh, what would be an appropriate arbitration forum. Thank you very much, Michael. That was very interesting. And as you say, an insight into that sort of mentality and the motivations for what they're thinking when they're investing um, is, is interesting. Because obviously, as arbitration lawyers, we're very much focused on the dispute resolution mechanisms and what do we do if it goes wrong. But I understand from what you were saying, they don't really care about that as much. They're more about the cash flow and making their project stand up in, in the long term. So then perhaps, um, Olga, did you have anything you wanted to add to that before I, I move on to Julia? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. In fact, Michael and I often work together, so both in terms of uh, client work, but also in uh, academia. In fact, uh, teach Belt and Road Investment Law at the Hong mm -hmm. Kong University. So, um, so I always come in from, uh, from Michael to cover the transactional perspective, the business, commercial, and risk mitigation perspective of uh, Chinese uh, entities going and investing in uh, Africa, whereas I would often come in uh, from the investment protection perspective and uh, and uh, dispute resolution perspective in a sense. And uh, as Michael as Michael mentioned, the uh, concerns that Chinese investors would have in uh, planning and structuring their investment in uh, Africa, just in terms of mitigating investment risk, would be obviously the fact that. Uh, uh, some of the African jurisdictions would be high sovereign risk jurisdictions. Um, there would be a risk of uh, expropriation or uh, potentially a change of regime or other forms of uh, undue government interference, adverse legislation, uh, imposition of additional taxes and levies that did not exist at the time the investment was planned and made, or other circumstances, uh, circumstances of which you uh, here in the news on, on a daily basis, such as, for example, uh, hostilities or civil unrest or backlash against uh, Chinese investment in Africa that may have an impact on uh, Chinese investment projects in um, African jurisdictions. And of course, the Chinese investors are uh, um, interested and in, uh, have to find a way to mitigate the risk. And typically, there would be uh, two main uh, areas uh, in which such risk mitigated. The first would be a contract-based investment protection mechanism, and the second would be treaty-based investment protection mechanism. On the first one, as Michael mentioned, oftentimes this large uh, all-bore built and road uh, infrastructure projects in uh, Africa 
uh, do not give the scope to a Chinese investor to negotiate or build into a contract contract based investment protection mechanism because that would be uh, an open bidding situation where those contracts would already be at least templates sort of agreed framework uh, would be provided by uh, by the host state. So oftentimes there's very limited scope to renegotiate that. But at the very least, uh, in, in, uh, in these types of contracts, we often have stabilization clause, which is, uh, uh, and I know Michael has different views on that, but uh, at the very least, that's a contract-based investment protection mechanism that would give a Chinese investor at least the right to demand uh, renegotiation of the contracts to bring the economic equilibrium of the contract to the uh, state that it was at before the uh, legislative change occurred, for example. Then there would be waiver of sovereign immunity clauses uh, that are essential, uh, in particular when Chinese entities are dealing with uh, other state-owned enterprises on the African side, or even uh, with uh, state agencies and, um, um, and departments. And then, of course, dispute resolution clause. And on that, I would rely on our experts Julia and, and uh, Dunde, but uh, it is true, and we've had these situations with Michael, where uh, negotiating a dispute resolution clause, where a dispute would be taken out of the jurisdiction of the whole state, out of Africa, they move to Paris or London or Stockholm, that might actually be very difficult for the African counterpart to accept, because these investment projects are often strategically important for the whole state. And the government would just not be willing to surrender uh, these particularly important disputes to another jurisdiction. So we had a number of uh, very interesting uh, uh, negotiation situations with the um, African counterpart. Our dispute resolution uh, can be uh, renegotiated. And finally, uh, the second um, uh, investment protection mechanism would be rooted in um, uh, China's and African investment protection treaty. Now, China has probably uh, the only jurisdiction in the world that has uh, so many bilateral investment treaties, party to a number of multilateral investment treaties as well. China has over 140 bilateral investment treaties in place. Um, the majority, though, of those treaties would be a first and second generation, and they would not necessarily be investor friendly. Uh, so they wouldn't afford um, uh, enough substantive protection to Chinese investors investing overseas. But the latest generation of those treaties, and interestingly, those treaties, the latest China's treaties, would be concluded with African states. And those would be more balanced, more uh, sort of investor-friendly uh, treaties that would allow for exit arbitration where appropriate, that would uh, allow for unsubscribed arbitration, and there will be an and um, uh, a number of other options that would take the dispute out of jurisdiction of the host state and before an investment tribunal. And then Hong Kong, of course, uh, and it's important to note, Hong Kong has its own uh, treaty um, program. Uh, Hong Kong as a special administrative region um, uh, has uh, enough uh, autonomy to negotiate its own bilateral investment treaties. So a Chinese investor from Hong Kong investing out of Hong Kong in Africa might not necessarily be covered by China's uh, bilateral investment. So that's an, an important point to note. And Hong Kong has about 20 bilateral investment at the moment, and they're not uh, with uh, with African states. So in terms of structuring that, and that's uh, an important uh, point to keep in mind. And finally, concluding on the statistics, if you look, say, at the UNCTAD uh, GD case uh, depository and see uh, how many uh, cases the state arbitration were brought against um, the African states and who would be the investor, the jurisdiction of the investor, you would see that predominantly African states get uh, sued by investors from developed states that in China, um, uh, very rarely Chinese um, uh, enterprises would uh, sue African states under investment treaties. There would be cases here and there. Recently, there was a case by uh, Standard Charter Hong Kong against uh, Tanzania, but uh, those cases are very rare. So that, uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude. Andrew. Thank you very much, Olga. That's fascinating to see the, the other side and layers of protection that are, are being thought about and put in. 
One thing that I, I got very much from what both you and Michael were saying was that there seems to be a disconnect between the fears and the skepticism of Chinese investors in opting for an African seat for their arbitration uh, versus the, the strategic importance of many of these investments for those African nations and they wanting to keep that control over that dispute resolution mechanism closer to home. So perhaps I could turn to you, Julia, and ask you know, if you could give us your perspective um, of an institution on the ground, given your experience with KJAC and AFSA, for example, how are African jurisdictions responding to that tension and trying to make um, Chinese investors more comfortable with choosing perhaps an African seat? Thank you, Andrew. Um, what Michael and Olga said are very, very interesting. And um, I'm sure the, I mean, the African parties and the Chinese parties, they both realize there is actually a gap and a need um, for the dispute resolution mechanisms. I think that is the reason behind the establishment of KJEC, the China uh, Africa Joint Arbitration Center. And that center is, um, is a product of FOLCAC, which is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And it is agreed among all the um, states, uh, heads of the states of Africa and um, China that in terms of the cooperation between China and Africa, um, we need a dispute resolution mechanism. And that is the, um, the establishment of KJEC. And um, they made it an action plan in the uh, FOLCAC declaration in 2015. So from 2015 up until 20, uh, 2021, what we have done as KJEC is um, in 2015, um, the first two uh, arbitral institutions were identified, which is AFSA, the, the um, Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa that's in Johannesburg. And it, it, it's SHIA, it's the Shanghai International Arbitration Center. And then um, thereafter, it just grew into six partners. So we included three Chinese partners, Biak, um, SHIA, Biak, and uh, SKIA. Um, and in, in, in Africa, it's um, uh, AFSA and Kenya and OHADA. So you can see that the mechanism is trying to include um, a wide jurisdiction in Africa um, in order to just uh, cater different areas of Africa because Africa is big. And I think in um, a lot of Chinese um, people and Chinese companies concept, Africa is one country. Sometimes people would have that concept that Africa is one country. They don't realize that we are over 50 countries. Every single country has a different legal system and it's, it's just everything is different. Um, that's why we're trying to cover Africa with, now we have Southern Africa, we have East Africa with Kenya, we have um, um, Ohada, and we are still trying to complete the structure in Africa. And what we did in, um, with KJEC is that we drafted a set of uniform rules. Um, that uniform rules is going to be used by um, all the, the disputes uh, submitted to KJEC, but in that set of rules, we do have different sections um, that follows the local rules um, of each uh, KJEC partner because not everything can be uni unified. So that, that took us quite a bit of time to draft and approve that a set of uniform rules. And that the, the draft of that uniform rules was actually based on the Chinese arbitration rules. And we made some modification to suit the um, African needs. Um, because of the difference between the civil law system and the, the uh, common law system, um, we like in South Africa and a lot of other African countries, we are more used to the, I mean, we are the common law, so we're used to all the oral hearings and things. Um, but in China, there are a lot of like, um, submissions in writing and their oral hearings are limited to like a day or half a day. Um, so we have to take into consideration of all that. So in this set of new rules, we, we, we made the provisions for language 
we made provisions for the, the form of the, the hearing or the tribunal can actually decide whether everything can be submitted in writing or it has to have an um, um, oral hearing. Um, and that we believe um, can give the Chinese investors some uh, certainty because they can even in the agreement to agree that the language of the arbitration is in Chinese. And that is probably a big advantage for the Chinese uh, investors. Um, another thing is it, it, it just provides that, for instance, the, the time of the arbitration, it can be concluded with, it, the normal arbitration will be concluded within like um, six months, or if it's um, uh, expedited, it will be concluded within three months. So it, it just gives you a, a time period where it's predictable. And for the um, for the for the investors and the, the African host countries, they will know that if if they submit to this um, set of rules, there will be a limited time when this dispute can be resolved, and they will not like last forever. And that is, um, I mean, the some of the Chinese investors would have that concept that uh, it's going to last forever. Um, it's, I mean, I put on my hat as an attorney. I don't see the contract before when, while they are negotiated or whatever, but I do see them when the dispute arises. So when some, sometimes when I see the contract, I would say to myself uh, that I wish the, the attorney, when they draft this agreement, they could look at the dispute resolution clause uh, more carefully so that they don't bump into the problems that they have. Like sometimes they use the wrong name, they, they refer to the wrong institution, and there is no, like, you can't find the jurisdiction by that agreement. And sometimes um, they, they have the misconcept that they, the, the African countries um, don't have a, a, a complete or a comprehensive legal system, and any um, any litigation or arbitration is going to take years, which is not really the case. I think it, with KJAC rules, that, that is what we are trying to um, trying to make, it, to give some certainty to the Chinese and the African um, parties that with this set of rules, they can find the, the Chinese taste, they can find the, the African way of doing things, and it's a combination. But obviously, it's still at its early stage. The rules have just been finalized and for the rules to be uh, adopted by various parties, it will take a, a process of promoting the rules. And obviously the attorneys and the legal counsels will have to understand the rules, recommend them to their clients. Um, so it, it will be a process and we haven't really uh, resolved any dispute under the KJAC rules, but that is definitely our goal to um, to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That's fascinating. So it seems like you know, a lot of thought has gone into perhaps, you know, dealing with that culture shock between the, the Chinese expectations and what they're used to at home, and then the, the common law systems where arbitration can take a year or two, and you can have a two-week oral hearing, which is something completely alien to, to Chinese clients. Um, yes. It will be interesting to see you know, the, the take up of the KJAC rules and, and as you say, that blend between getting the Chinese comfortable, but still keeping it African to a, a sense as well. Yes. Um, perhaps, I'm just conscious of the time, perhaps I could turn to Tunde and ask, <clears throat> as a practitioner on the ground, what are the specific types of disputes that you are seeing coming through um, is the paradigm that only foreign in parties um, are introducing arbitrations against African states still accurate, or ha have we seen a bit of a shift? And how do you think these new KJAC rules will will change that, if at all? Will will we be seeing a, a fundamental shift in the type of cases being brought in Africa? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, well, first of all, let me start by saying that there's, there's a lot that's very familiar in what um, Olga and Michael have, have said. So I, I don't plan to say too much on this subject other than to kind of give some uh, confirmation within the specific Nigerian context, which is where I practice. Um, so the typical sectors that are engaged are the ones that uh, pretty much have been mentioned by Olga and, and Michael. 
Uh, China is very heavy on the ground in Nigeria in the construction sector, whether it's uh, construction for private projects like oil and gas infrastructure, or whether it's construction for public projects like roads, uh, bridges, uh, um, you know, so China is very heavy on the ground in that regard. Uh, the oil and gas sector also, China is heavily invested in the oil and gas sector. Uh, among the clients I represent are companies that are very active in the exploration and production uh, 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 space in Nigeria. Um, the other thing that I can very easily confirm is, you know, the culture of pragmatism uh, and, and uh, always trying to avoid uh, disputes than to go into disputes. Indeed, very recently, one of the most major projects in Nigeria relating to the Mambila, uh, Mambila Dam. It's a, it's, a, it's a very major power project, probably the second largest hydro uh, power project in Africa, uh, had gone into dispute between the Nigerian government and someone who, be, who succeeded in, in, in bidding for the project. Uh, and, and the government had withdrawn the contract from that contractor. It was going to go to two Chinese companies and um, but, but uh, China insisted that the, 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 the matter be settled before it was going to be able to proceed. And, and the Chinese Export Import Bank played a very significant role. So that, that culture of pragmatism kind of comes across. Um, yeah, let me talk about BITs. I, I think uh, Olga referred to BITs. And again, there's, there's confirmation in terms of what I see on the ground. Uh, Nigeria has been a, a, a signatory to um, the ICSID convention since the late 60s. And uh, today, there are probably just about only four claims that have been brought against Nigeria. So this, this, is a, this, is, this applies, I think, generally to investors. N Nigeria and China have um, a BIT, and um, there have been disputes I've seen that could very easily engage international law that could have you know, engaged provisions of the BIT, but that have never have not gone to, to ICSID. And that's because generally with investors, there's a reluctance to take the state to be at, to, to, to exit. And they'd rather explore that means of, um, of resolving. And I see this particularly, uh, uh, you know, uh, manifested in, in Chinese, uh, Chinese, Chinese transactions in Nigeria. I have seen uh, disputes taken to arbitration. Uh, I have represented a Chinese oil company against the national, uh, uh, national oil company in a uh, in, in a contractual dispute, not um, uh, not 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 an invest investor state dispute. It's all in the public domain because it went to court uh, already. So it's pretty much in the public domain already, um, and and it it arises in the con same context that I spoke about in, a, in the oil and gas context. The, to, as to your second question, Andrew, um, do we see? I, I think we can conceive of um, you know uh, states bringing arbitrations against investors uh, or uh, whether in investment state, investor state dispute type situations or in purely commercial arbitrations. I have not personally seen any, it is not prevalent in Nigeria. I think the reason for that is that the state typically has so many other options available to it that from its perspective are more effective. The state can you know, uh, um, procure legislative change the, 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 if it feels aggrieved by any particular state of circumstances, it can procure legislation. The regulator can impose regulatory measures. Uh, so those typically tend to be the measures that the state would resort to in the event of a dispute uh, rather than go to arbitration. I think that accounts for the very little examples that we've seen of uh, the very few, if any, examples there are of, of the state taking uh, an investor to arbitration, whether in a commercial context or an investor state context. Um, the only other point I'd make finally is that, yeah, you, you probably draw distinctions between contracts with private individuals. In other words, Chinese Chinese entity contracts with private individual private entities, <laughs> and Chinese uh, entity contracts with public public entities like uh, like government or parastatals. And uh, you would you would normally see differences arising in those two contexts, one of which might have to do with uh, the kind of dispute resolution mechanism that uh, typically, and I will speak a bit more about this later on. Typically, government tends to have a policy on where its disputes should be resolved, and uh, we, we, so so that kind of qualifies the 
freedom of contract that you see in that context and typically tends to then resolve you know, resolve by bargaining strength at the end of the day. I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you, that's fascinating. So I think it seems just to wrap up then, it seems that you know that there is a, a lot of challenges for African arbitration when dealing with Chinese investors. First, you have this fear and skepticism, this general mistrust, but then you also have this, this preference for dealing with matters pragmatically rather than going perhaps through formal arbitral processes, or as you say, going through the investment dispute mechanisms through exit. So thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to pass back to Thomas, who, who can take the, the conversation forward. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Um, and yes, indeed, we've heard that there are many, many challenges, many adverse factors uh, to African seats. And that, that prompts the question, are uh, African seats equipped uh, with arbitration infrastructure uh, to handle these Chinese-African African disputes? And Julia started uh, by, by, um, started by, by explaining that uh, how tailored, uh, for instance, the KJAC rules and, and um, uh, would, be, would, be, would be for this, this type of disputes. But there is an aspect that is also very important, uh, and that's the judiciary. And, and, and I'm, I'm turning to, uh, uh, to Tunde and, and, and Julia, um, how, to, to how important is the judiciary uh, system from, from, your, from your point of view as, as arbitration practitioners? And then I suspect we'll hear perhaps a different, a different answer from the point of view of the, of the negotiator with Michael, but, but uh, starting with, uh, with Tunde and, Tunde and, and, and Julia, um, uh, Tunde, what's, what's, what's your perspective on this, on the, the importance of the judiciary system? Well, the, the, the courts are very critical. I mean, they, they are among those factors that, uh, you know, parties look to when they are determining what to put in the arbitration clause, when they are determining what seats to choose. I think there have been studies by Queen Mary University and the number of, uh, in collaboration with one or two law firms from the UK that, that uh, empirically established this. The seat is very important. And one of, the, one of the important factors in choosing a seat is the courts. There are two points, uh, uh, two critical points from my perspective from which the courts are important. The first is enforcing the arbitration agreement and the second is enforcing the award. And as you would remember, these are the two focal points of the New York Convention. Um, why is enforcing the arbitration agreement important? Because in my practice, I have seen a tendency among a good number of contracting parties, particularly those that come from the host country to renege on their obligations under dispute resolution clauses, particularly where those clauses choose foreign forums, because they have a lot more confidence in the courts of their own forum. So they try to divert the dispute from the agreed uh, seat into, the, into their own local courts, either because they feel that they will get sympathy in their local courts, or they, they perceive that they have influence over their local courts. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that, that Chinese investors must be aware of. Uh, but, but at the same time, um, the solution to that, obviously, is one, is the, is the host country a signatory to the New York Convention, uh, and, and Nigeria is. And, and what does that then translate into in practice? It means that um, the, the, the Nigerian courts understand that it's a treaty obligation. It's a treaty obligation not to allow um, you know, lo local host uh, counterparties to divert the dispute from the chosen seat into the local courts. And we see decisions from local courts quite uh, actively enforcing that concept. Uh, the second point is enforcement. Unfortunately, you can't choose your seat when it comes to enforcement because you follow the assets and the assets could take you into any jurisdiction at all. And again, that's where Nigeria's ratification of the New York Convention becomes important uh, because um, the facility is there. You don't, you don't need to have obtained uh, judgment in your own court first before you come to Nigeria. Awards are directly enforceable in Nigeria under the provisions of the Arbitration Act, which implement the New York Convention. Uh, so I, I, I think those are two factors that Chinese investors must take into account when determining the suitability of Nigeria as a seat or as a as a as a as a potential venue for enforcement proceedings.
Thank you very much, uh, Tunde. Uh, so we've heard that it's it's essential to have a, a, a system where the, where the courts respect just the party's agreement to, to arbitrate and, and and in terms of enforcement that they, they abide by, by the party's forecast that they, they're going to get a decision that is enforceable. Now, now Julia, what is, what is your take on, on, on this? Uh, thanks, Tomo and um, Tunde. I, I totally agree with Tunde. I think uh, a lot of Chinese investors, they, as I mentioned just now, they have a misconcept about the, the African um, legal system. It's just because we have this oral hearing is almost like endless. I mean, if we are in court, um, whatever the parties have to say, the, the court will just listen. The court just plays a, a role like an umpire. The court is not going to play any inquisitorial role. So that, that process is unpredictable almost for the Chinese um, investors. And there are many cases where the court case can last years. And that is kind of uh, triggered that misconcept that the, the African uh, legal system doesn't work. It's actually not the case, but, uh, but, but I think that is one of the other reason that the Chinese uh, investors are a bit skeptical about choosing an uh, African seat. But as Tunde correctly put, when you come to the enforcement of the award, you don't really have much of a choice. If the asset is in that country, you just have to go back to that um, African court in any case, and you can't really avoid that. So I think, I think um, the, the judiciary really plays a very wide, vital role in, in um, just encourage this um, arbitration culture and the attitude of the court and the different court, um, the, the decisions of the court will give the, um, not only the arbitration attorneys, but maybe the parties more confidence in, in certain African court. Um, like, like in South Africa, um, years ago, the High Court made some very wrong decisions, which just basically turned away a lot of um, international parties. They like, no, never. We're not going to South Africa at all. Um, th that's how the, the market actually react to the, the court decisions. But then um, the, the Constitutional Court um, reverted that decision and there are some other court decisions. And especially now in, in, the, um, in 2017, we promulgated the International Arbitration Act, um, which incorporated the, the uh, ancestral model law and the court is following that. And also um, the Johannesburg High Court set up this commercial court aiming at speeding up the, the commercial matters, including arbitration. So if you have this arbitration, any interim uh, measure or the enforcement, it, you can go to the commercial court and it, it will be a more um, expedited process. So I think all those measures help. And our, um, I mean, the court in, in uh, South Africa, they're also looking at um, a more expedited um, process to, to the enforcement. And they're wor working on it and very soon, um, we, are, we can expect a, a court directive on how the arbitration matters can be dealt with. So I think um, in that regard, like the Chinese uh, court, they, they have a, a commercial court in China and the commercial court said they will have a one-stop kind of um, solution for dispute resolution where they, they, will, they have a few arbitration institutions in connection with the court and those court, the commercial court will deal with the arbitration related um, litigations or the court applications directly, which um, obviously is a, a very, very efficient and good thing for the parties when they think of the court, they're not so intimidated. So I think a lot of uh, um, African countries are trying to do the same. And um, in, in, in South Africa, we, we have had what I said just now, and EFSA is also trying to engage with the, the SEDEC countries, the, the Southern Africa Development Community. We have 16 countries there. And we're trying to um, harmonize the, the arbitration law and practice um, in the SEDEC countries. Obviously, that's a huge project. And we, we're starting now. But the 
prospect is, is to um, encourage the um, use of African seed. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Julia. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of, of, of the time. So perhaps, Michael, uh, before, before I, I give back the, the floor to, to Andrew uh, for the third question, Michael, uh, we've, we've, we've heard that the, the, the legal system of the seat and also at the place of enforcement, where it's not the same, is massively important in reality. How often, and we've heard, the, 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 we've heard your explanation about the number of factors that Chinese investors take into account when negotiating a contract, how often um, does the the arbitration well the the, the courts uh, arbitration friendliness uh, come into the discussion and what proportion it takes in the discussion when there is a negotiation of a contract in your experience okay um, at the beginning I talked about there are two main ways there the uh, where the Chinese sponsors actually participate in one pro, uh, in this type of football uh, projects one is by the open international tender the other way is by uh, negotiations right Be private negotiations between a Chinese sponsor and the, uh, the the host government now in the second situation everything goes really I mean everything is open to negotiations and even in the first circumstances where it's open tender even the jurisdiction, even if it's actually in the tender document, it doesn't mean that the sponsor cannot reopen that. It depends on how desperate, you know, the host jurisdiction actually needs that. And so it can go into a, a, a grading system in terms of when uh, uh, the host government evaluates each bid, the more that you actually deviate from what is the tender document, then the less likely that you'll actually get a bid. But at the end of the day, it's the money that talks and also, you know, the other terms that matters as well. So. It could be even in open tender situation, the jurisdiction issue um, and the arbitration forum may become an issue that is open for discussion once again, just like in the second situation where uh, it's via um, private negotiations between two parties. So um, whether the parties, especially the China sponsor, will then go into a very rational discussion and um, you know to, to understand the technicalities of uh, the jurisdiction, the security of the arbitration forum, whether it's actually a fair um, uh, forum to do it. A as I explained at the beginning, yes, they will listen to it. Um, but a lot of times, if you look into the decision-making mechanisms of a lot of these uh, projects, first of all, you have to understand uh, these are not, as I say, limited recourse financing. And how do they do this parent back guarantee financing is that relies on a couple of very critical items. One is the insurer for the for sovereign risk, which is Sinoshore. And they'll look at whether Sinoshore will have a say in, is this actually something, uh, if I'm gonna cover you for sovereign risk, such as expropriation, such as like in the situation Thunder has uh, described just now, where despite the fact that the parties have agreed on exclusive jurisdiction of the arbitration forum to resolve dispute, the local judiciary decides to take over and say, they don't have actual jurisdiction. This is a local jurisdiction issue. This becomes a sign of short issue, becomes an insurance issue. And then you have to look at the insurer and why they agree to it. If they don't agree to it, uh, the Chinese project do not actually get the financing at all to complete the project. So this is something that, again, from other international investors, they may not have this concern or uh, they may not need to actually understand this process where the insurer uh, plays a very important part in it uh, that goes to the financing and that goes to the viability of the project. So at the end of the day, you may have a rational um, explanation on uh, whether it's JCAX or whether it's another uh, type of arbitration uh, forum that's totally objective, but you still have to actually run part of that test. And I think that test to a large extent at the moment anyway, is very much dictated by the past experience of having had bad experiences with certain jurisdictions. So for example, Tunda and Julie have explained, and I'm sure a lot of Chinese investors will agree that Nigeria and South Africa are two of the best examples of where the jurisdiction is trustworthy, you know, in terms of um, enforcement, uh, in terms of the rule of law being observed. But there are also other jurisdictions along the Obo route, which are not necessary in that category. Thank you very much, Michael. And that makes me think um, that two things. The first thing is that um, 
the Delos Guide to Arbitration Places was actually established to, um, to provide some predictability. And, um, and, and it summarizes all the findings and the, the salient features um, of the, um, uh, in respect of all the jurisdictions uh, that, are, that are dealt with in the, in the, in the, in the guide uh, in a table with traffic lights, green, red, orange, um, which, which helps in a very easy and, and user-friendly uh, manner uh, evaluate basically where are the areas where jurisdiction uh, presents a risks just in terms of, of, of arbitration law. So I'm saying this in passing, that was the first point. The second point is that your answer uh, makes a very good transition for the next question. Uh, which is uh, which addresses approaches and beliefs in the negotiation of an arbitration agreement uh, between between Chinese in investors and, and African parties. So, Andrew, let me uh, pass on the baton to you. Thank you, Thomas. And and you're correct. That was a great segue, Michael, into into the next subject for discussion. Um, you've given us a, a fascinating sort of peek behind the veil of the commercial thinking of Chinese investors. So perhaps we could turn to focus on the thinking behind the negotiation of arbitration clauses themselves, <laughs> whether there is any, or whether these are just seen as like the end of a very long negotiation, boilerplate clauses that no one pays any attention to. So perhaps we'll start with the ideal paradigm and ask Olga and Tunde from, as arbitration practitioners, what, how should it look? What would be the ideal um, scenario in uh, dealing with and deciding on um, your, your seat and your choice of governing law. And then we'll, we'll go and ask Michael and Julia what actually happens in practice. But perhaps, Olga, you'd like to start and then we'll go on to Tunde. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to refer back to what uh, Michael was saying in terms of negotiating um, the arbitration clauses and dispute resolution clauses and the actual underlying investment agreement. And I agree with uh, Michael's opinions on that. But in addition to that, um, in, just in terms of the uh, value of seed, value of victory, in addition to the actual underlying investment agreement, that is the concession agreement or EPC or TPE or others, there would be uh, a very important uh, uh, related contractual arrangement, such as, for example, the financing arrangement with the uh, financial institution such as facility agreement, but also a security agreement to ensure that uh, the uh, sponsored financial obligations are complied with. And when negotiating these related uh, agreements, there is also an issue of what dispute resolution clause uh, is going to be in those agreements. And when you look at uh, these uh, agreements, finance related agreements, essentially the collateral would often be located in, uh, in Africa. Uh, and if uh, the financial obligations are not complied with, they're either uh, going to be a pledge of the shares, African company that's running the investment owned in part by the Chinese investor, or there'll be some other arrangement that would attach itself to the asset located in Africa. And from that point of view, potentially, it might even make more sense uh, to uh, agree to litigation in uh, um, African courts where the assets are located just from the point of view of enforcement, because it might potentially be easier to enforce a court judgment in that particular jurisdiction than try and enforce an arbitral award issued somewhere in, say, in London or in Paris or in uh, Stockholm. And then further, when uh, negotiating uh, the actual arbitration clauses in the, in the underlying investment, there are a number of issues that um, the, uh, the parties would uh, would look at. And of course, ideally, from the arbitration practitioner point of view, it's not going to be a template provision from some other contract by, by way of a midnight clause, but rather there would be an informed negotiated decision with which both parties agree. And the uh, the issues that uh, the parties typically take into account, or at least the uh, Chinese parties would, uh, would look at, would be that the, uh, several um, the, uh, first of all, and that's uh, some of the issues that we've encountered in the latest cases, uh, whether uh, the whole state in Africa is a common law or civil law jurisdiction, and that's what Julia mentioned as well, the Chinese parties are more familiar with uh, civil law uh, 
jurisdictions, but uh, now with uh, CADJAC and other initiatives in South Africa, uh, there appears to be a merger of the two that would make it more uh, available to the Chinese party. Then they would look at uh, the council uh, pool in that particular jurisdiction, because as Tunde was mentioning before, and Julia as well, uh, whether it's arbitration or not, if uh, an award is forced in that particular jurisdiction, still have to go to courts and uh, therefore you'd need local council to uh, say uh, run the uh, enforcement procedure in local courts and the question is is there a pool of uh, litigated arbitration practitioners in that jurisdiction uh, who would be available for this proceeding for example some jurisdictions like South Africa and Nigeria and uh, Ethiopia and others they have this very dynamic uh, uh, legal uh, community so, environment where you can easily find a uh, suitable council. But some other jurisdictions, uh, smaller ones, such as Uti, for example, might have difficulty with uh, um, uh, providing full of litigation and, uh, arbitration practitioners. So when deciding where to uh, um, the, uh, the dispute in, uh, in African jurisdictions, that could be a situation. Then, of course, uh, Tunde was mentioning transparent and predictable legal system. Uh, and Julia has mentioned that South Africa adopted control model law and, and whether uh, the whole state uh, appears to answer control model law with which everyone is familiar is a consideration, but also the, um, whether uh, the jurisdiction is um, uh, uh, contracting your convention for enforcement purposes or its convention is a very important consideration. Despite uh, this um, uh, um, idea that uh, uh, virtually every state is member state of the New York Convention. It's not really the case. Some important African jurisdictions um, are not uh, uh, contracting parties to the New York Convention. I think Namibia is not, uh, uh, Republic of Congo is not a uh, member to the New York Convention, Chad, uh, uh, Somalia, a number of other uh, states are not. So that would be a major consideration when deciding if you actually want to have an arbitration clause, so or whether you're actually stuck with uh, litigation as opposed to arbitration. And, um, and a number of other considerations, including the actual wording of the arbitration clause, the scope of the jurisdiction that the tribunal would have, uh, the types of disputes that would be covered, um, and, and uh, a number of others. So ideally, that would be an informed, negotiated um, a clause uh, that that uh, uh, that would be adopted by both parties rather than the midnight uh, midnight clause provision. Thank you. Thanks very much, Olga. I think that was an excellent summary of, of the key considerations that that we as advising council need to be taking into account. Um, Tunde, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. What I'd like to add to that, um, Andrew, is um, I mean I, I agree with everything that Olga has said and. Um, um, in my experience, um, you know, again, like I, like I said earlier, you tend to see different considerations applying, whether you are dealing with a public entity, a state entity on the one hand, or whether as a Chinese contractor or investor, you are dealing with a counterparty who is just a private entity itself. Obviously, with private entities, there's a huge amount of freedom of contract, and it all boils down to negotiating strength. The dispute clause you end up with is a matter of it depending on relative bargaining strength. Uh, on the other hand, with government establishments, you tend to find that they pretty much present you with something on a take it or leave it basis. And one of the arbitrations that I've done for a Chinese entity has been one in which um, the, the, you know, the, there's a standard format for production sharing contracts in Nigeria, in the oil and gas industry. And it is one that selects a Nigerian state and, 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 and requires Nigerian law. Uh, and, and there's increasing awareness, the, the, well, there's increasing attention to uh, arbitration clauses in, in government establishments, uh, to, uh, and there's a move towards having a policy that, that, that makes that applicable across all sectors, not just in the oil and gas sector alone. Um, so the other point I'd like to note, um, so while, while, like I said earlier, there's definitely party autonomy, when there's more party autonomy when you are dealing with a private counterparty. Um, you, 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 the, uh, as a Chinese contractor, you have to be mindful of certain types of legislations that might qualify that. Uh, Nigeria, for instance, has a local content requirement. 
in the oil and gas sector. That means that even in even in legal services, even in the, in the in the legal services sector, you have to ensure that there's a certain amount of work reserved for Nigerian lawyers. Now, is that likely to affect your choice of dispute clause? I have it, it's been raised in a case in which I am involved. It's been raised against my client that the choice of um, an, of ICC arbitration in London under English law violates Nigerian con local content requirements because it makes the appointment of English counsel 100% inevitable. Um, now, that argument hasn't gone to judgment yet, so we don't know what the Nigerian courts will say about it. But those types of risks, from my perspective, can be balanced by, by achieving a fair balance between three elements that you typically see in your dispute clause. That's your choice of law, your choice of seats, and your choice of venue. And when I say venue, I mean the, the actual place where arbitrations are held. These three things are, are within the control of the parties, and you can combine your approach to these three factors in such a way as to be able to get around potential risks that are presented by local legislation that otherwise might invalidate your arbitration agreement. Great, thank you very much indeed. So yeah, I think, you know, in, in an ideal world, um, these would be well considered and negotiated clauses between uh, equal parties. Um, Michael, perhaps I can turn to you first. And is that what you see in practice? How, how as a commercial lawyer, do you view um, arbitration or dispute resolution clauses? Yeah, we've seen all elements of that. I think what Tender and Olga described are, uh, you know, typically what we see. But I think the commercial reality at the end of the day is who has the upper hand in terms of negotiation powers that dictates it. So even in the situation where there is local content requirement, I have seen very often that in the concession agreement, you ask for exemption from that and um, not necessary actually in terms of uh, the legal, the lawyers that you use, but uh, in terms of employment of uh, local crew in construction or even in terms of the local content of the cement that you use, you can actually ask for concession. So it depends on the project, whether it's one that the Chinese sponsor is begging to actually enter into that contract or in some cases here, like uh, an early example that Tender has given uh, in relation to the hydro dam project, it was previously handled by a previous investor, but then that fell through and then the Chinese investors come in and take it up. Now, those are actually very uh, dispute prone, I've got to say, because in those cases here, you're not only dealing with the host government, you're potentially dealing with an exclusively arrangement with the previous investor and other you know, uh, residual claims that the uh, previous investor may have not only against host government, but also on the new investors on the ground of even on tortious ground to say that there's tortious interference, you actually get the uh, investment under us to invest in it. So um, whether you're talking about at the end of the day, it, it, it would be an ideal situation. You just go with the logistics and rationality of justifying which is the better. Uh, uh, arbitration forum um, and or saying that because the law provides for you must do this and that it will definitely be the result you know or be the guiding principle to decide which arbitration forum to adopt I think not necessarily and I've seen a lot of cases where uh, they will ask for dispensation but again I mean, it depends on the relative ne uh, negotiations powers of the of the of the entities if it's a project everybody is actually vying for then i think the sponsor would not have much say in it but if it's a project that has previously failed uh, like the hydro project that's been described before and you're actually picking up the pieces then i think the government is more likely to bend over backwards to accommodate what the sponsors require Thank you. I mean, that makes a lot of sense that you know, the commercial context and the reality around it plays a huge, huge role. Julia, would, did you have any comments from the South African perspective with your practice there and what you, what you have seen in reality? Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. The, the, ide the ideal in the ideal world, all those uh, elements that Tunde and Michael, they mentioned, will, will all play a role. And ideally, when you look at the dispute resolution clause, it should cover all that aspect. But in, in reality, I think it's it's not only um, sometimes it's it's depend on the, the attorney's um, understanding and knowledge about the, the, the arbitration uh, as well. 
um, because we've often seen like in South Africa, the South African attorneys, they are very um, familiar with the concept of arbitration, but they might not be very familiar with the concept of the, the international arbitration or the difference between the domestic and the international arbitration. In the domestic arbitration, they don't have to consider the seat or, or venue or whatever. Uh, well, they can have in Johannesburg, Cape Town, it doesn't really matter. But in international arbitration, obviously that plays a major role. And um, we, we often actually see the contract from um, uh, when the dispute arises, when that comes to AFSA, that, that there will be a clause that comes from nowhere that it, it says um, South Africa, uh, the, the, um, in terms of the, the um, in terms of the EFSA rules, but then in terms of the EFSA um, Arbitration Act of 1965, which basically governs the, the domestic arbitration. And then it comes um, to the, the clauses like the arbitration will be concluded in 21 days, which, um, which you know, not, not even, it hasn't even started yet in 21 days. So it ca cannot conclude in 21 days. But um, th that just shows that when the some of the attorneys drafting those clauses, they haven't really thought it through. They probably just took a clause from a president and that clause has been sitting on the shelf for like 30, 30 years and, and they just use it. Um, so I think, um, but when those attorneys giving the their clients uh, advice, they obviously don't really think of the dispute resolution clause. So that in reality is very far away from the, the, the ideal world when you have to actually consider. But obviously, like Michael said, if a project has already um, had some problem and if they have already had some um, dispute, then the parties will probably realize more of the importance of having a, a dispute resolution clause. And also, um, it, again, like Michael said, there is a, a bargaining power kind of thing that um, like the, the dispute that we dealt with administered in AFSA, um, we have a various foreign parties. We've actually had quite a lot of foreign parties from Europe, America, South America, um, Africa, even Asia. Um, but there is always, almost always a South African party. So, um, we do have contract from other countries like completely um, away from South Africa, but most of them like 90, 90 or 95 percent of them has a South African party. So it just says that in, in any contract, a, a commercial contract, they will, the, the party will have a say of the dispute resolution mechanism. Or we sometimes um, like saying that it's it's a beautiful marriage maybe they're looking forward to a cooperation together for this project but they don't make provisions for when things go wrong and when they want to divorce each other they don't know where to go and um, they don't consider that element um, and that that is um, often like in reality that element is the, the least element that they consider when they're trying to get married Thank you. And if I may actually add Thank to you, Julia. Uh, sorry, I'll be very quick actually on this one here. I absolutely agree with that. Um, and if you look at the entire process of negotiation, uh, uh, very often, you know, the final process in your negotiations will be sitting down with the other side for a seven day sort of like page turn to do it. And guess which provision is actually at the end of that documentation, that's when your page documentation is actually your dispute resolution provision. I've not ever seen a case that when the party sit down and say, let's spend a day to talk about the arbitration provision, it's always a dispute resolution, it's the last one that they talk about here. And after you've actually spent seven days there, negotiating about you know, the compensation in the event of default and early termination, and you've argued them to your face is red for two days just on that particular provision, the light is the end of the tunnel, you say this arbitration provision. Most people would just say that, okay, right, um, whatever you want to say. If they feel strongly about it, there is also a killer argument, actually, normally from the Chinese sponsor. And that is to say that my insurer won't do it. My bank won't do it. And if it's not bankable, the whole thing falls apart. You know, the past seven days negotiation finishes. So the reality is that you have to succumb to the third party's requirement, third party being the financier. And that is a very difficult argument to overcome for the host government or for the other side. 
Thank you, Michael. Yes, I, we seem to keep coming back to this, uh, this you know, depressing view that money talks and, and the, the, the negotiating power is, is not always even. Um, so, Julia, my last question then is, you know, we've, we've seen this disconnect between what it should be in theory and practice that you know, people sit down and genuinely think long and hard about their dispute resolution clauses and what would be sensible when, when the divorce finally happens, as you put it. And then what Michael's saying is, in reality, that just doesn't happen. People are tired. We've had seven days of negotiation. These are always at the back end of documents. And, and as you said yourself, Julia, you know, even lawyers don't always know what they're talking about when they're dealing with dispute resolution clauses. They'll pick up a 20-year-old precedent, throw it in, and, and move on. So how can the arbitral institutions start to bridge this gap and perhaps make people realize that, especially in long-term infrastructure projects like we're talking about, when things go wrong, it can have huge consequences and perhaps the dispute resolution clauses should be given more weight and precedent. Um, I think one of the most important role that the institution can play is uh, training and education. It's just to um, to to e even just inform the, the lawyers where they, they might be very good in, in other aspects, but they're not very familiar with uh, arbitration. And um, so as an institution, uh, we, we play a role in that aspect and we, we organize trainings from time to time, every year actually, because of COVID last year it was affected, but every year we actually organize trainings and the trainings are, are um, targeting at the legal practitioners where they, they join us and in our uh, syllabus, we include the different um, set of rules, um, including the KJAG rules. And that is how we, we teach the, the South African lawyers to understand the KJAG rules and the difference between the KJAG rules and the, um, the normal, like the EFSA rules, or the, they're more familiar with maybe the LCIA rules or the, the other common law uh, jurisdiction kind of rules. Um, that is one thing that we, we uh, keep on doing. Um, another thing is obviously through those um, conferences and different events and the, the, the webinars like this, we also organize this kind of webinars and um, different events and facing the, the, the legal practitioners and try to help them to understand so that when they are advising their client, they realize the importance of dispute resolution. And what we can give them is the bad examples of the contract. So we, we, we do take out some, some uh, dispute resolution clauses and we analyze those clauses and tell them why it's not working. Like the, the very normal clause in South Africa is, if the dispute is a financial one, you must do this. If it's a legal one, you must do that. If it is a whatever one, it, you, you must do a, a, a different thing. So the parties, before they even come to the, the dispute resolution process, they, they have to fight about whether it's a accounting dispute, whether it's a financial one or the legal one, it's already a, a different battle. So that those are the things that we do. And also um, in terms of both uh, bridging the cultural difference, the China Law Society, they, they organize a, a legal um, exchange program. Um, it's also on a yearly basis. So they work with um, different entities and institutions. And um, from EFSA's point of view, we every year we send some young legal practitioners to China, and um, in that in that session, they also focus uh, quite some time on the um, arbitration, on the Chinese arbitration law and practice. So those um, those exchange students, when they come back to South Africa, they will have a a, a very in depth, actually not very in depth, but a, a quite extensive and in depth understanding because they stay there for two weeks and they. All they do is to understand the Chinese law and the arbitration law and everything. So it, it will be a long term thing, but um, I believe with as time goes, um, with all the effort that we make, hopefully the legal practitioners, they will have a better understanding on the uh, um, arbitration law. And when they then come to the drafting of that arbitration clause, um, they will, they will have a, a more careful uh, consideration about that clause and then that clause will actually uh, work better in case the dispute arises.
Thank you, Julia. Yes, that's. I think you've put your finger on the on the nail there. That uh, it's about education. It's about raising awareness, and it, it sounds like you know you've already got that very much in hand from your end. And webinars like this and others will hopefully help that conversation be had. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll pass back to Toma. Um, Toma, it's up to you. I'm just noticing the time. We have a couple of questions in the Q and A box. Um, would you like to do those or? Yes, what, what I suggest uh, is that we, we tackle the, so the, the, the fourth question, which is the, the announced battle of the seats, and in particular, of, we have three representatives of, of seats in or, or, or very close to, 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 to Africa. But, um, and so the, the principle is that each of them, uh, each of you, should uh, explain what the, the distinctive features that make your seat uh, a fit for China Africa disputes. And I'm going to, I'm going, given that uh, Andrew rightly pointed out uh, the, the time constraint uh, we're under because we have questions in the QA, I'm going to uh, fix a particularly uh, strict rule, which is that you each have one minute to do that, not more than that. Um, so, shall we start perhaps with, uh, with Julia? In one minute, you have the, the difficult task of uh, expo presenting the, the science features of, of South Africa that makes it fit for Chinese African disputes? Um, well, first of all, we, um, we have a, a updated law. I think it's from legislation, uh, it, the international arbitration is supported by the legislation because of the International Arbitration Act. And then the court is getting uh, familiar with the, the, the arbitration and they are making the right decisions. And thirdly, uh, obviously, uh, with, um, I mean, South Africa and China, uh, China is like the biggest trading partner of South Africa for years. And um, South Africa is the biggest trading partner to China in Africa. So um, th that, that just gives China and um, uh, South Africa a lot of um, um, opportunities to have the exchange, even on legal, whether it's before or after the dispute arises. So I think more and more Chinese companies are getting used to the idea of having, uh, I mean, a dispute resolved in China and also, uh, I mean, in South Africa and also with the KJAC rules. As I said just now, we, we, we have the different set of rules. We have uh, uniform uh, rules. We have a, a joint panel that will all give it an advantage. Thank you very much, Julia. You're <laughs> right on time. Congratulations. Let's see if Hyundai can do uh, the same performance. Yes, Thomas. I mean, I, 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 well, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but not too fast. I tend to sit less in terms of battle, but more in terms of complementarity. Um, in a dispute between a Chinese entity and a South African entity, neutrality would mean that Lagos would be an ideal uh, uh, seat because Lagos is neutral. Likewise, in a dispute between a Chinese entity and a Nigerian entity, South Africa, Johannesburg or Cape Town would be ideal neutral venues. And so I see it more in terms of complementarity. These two seats can complement each other. A lot of the things that Julia said, Nigeria has them as well. Lagos or Abuja has them. Excellent hotel uh, support, excellent infrastructure support, uh, on citral model law compliant legislation. Nigeria has signed the New York Convention. You have a judiciary that's very sensitive to the needs of arbitration. So all those things are common between the two jurisdictions. Uh, so what I would stress really, is the complementarity between these two jurisdictions from the from the consideration of neutrality? This was short and sweet, and that makes Andrew's uh, task even more difficult. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm a litigator, so I see everything as a battle. Um, so <laughs> I'll start by quoting the Delos Gap, actually, which you can't argue with. <laughs> Mauritius is a stable, accessible, reliable, efficient, and neutral arbitration seat. And that's based on a number of things. The Mauritian government has, has been pushing for a number of years to make this a, a hub, a, a neutral seat for arbitration in Africa. The legislation, the International Arbitration Act here, adopts the unsuitable model. We've signed up to the New York Convention, so the, the underlying rules and laws are familiar to people. The judiciary, 
um, is supportive of arbitration without being intrusive. It will uh, grant interim measures, but will leave arbitrators to, to get on with things. We have many ins good institutions here, the LCIA MIAC um, partnership that was set up here. Uh, we have the PCA here, and we also have MARC. So if people want institutional rather than ad hoc arbitration, those services and rules are in place. Um, and finally, uh, all of these have been mentioned before, but they, the quality of the local bar and practitioners is also important. And actually, Mauritius allows foreign arbitration lawyers to provide services, arbitration services here without having to go through the normal qualification process. So again, um, importing uh, the right quality of counsel if one can't find it locally, which one can, um, is it's also an option. So it ticks all the boxes that um, Olga and Tunde talked about in the ideal scenario earlier. Thank you very much. So it makes a lot of competition for, for uh, places such as Paris, which uh, Olga mentioned, but, but also Hong Kong. I know, Olga, you wanted to, to say a few words about this. No more than one minute, because then we have two questions, uh, which are, uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, for, for, for Julia. Three questions, which, which touch upon the, the similar topics for, for Julia. So let's leave time to, to address them. So Olga, the floor is yours for one minute uh, in defense of a non-African seat, but, but still. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Andrew and I are on the same team, so I'll uh, make the same reference to uh, Delos uh, Gap Guide and, and, uh, and say that Hong Kong is considered to be one of the most uh, advanced uh, arbitral jurisdictions uh, uh, in, uh, in the Gap uh, Guide. Uh, the Hong Kong judiciary is considered to be very experienced uh, judiciary in uh, arbitration matters. Hong Kong arbitration ordinance is uh, modeled after the ancestral model law. The uh, practitioner school in Hong Kong is very diverse and, um, and active in, um, in arbitration, speaks uh, multiple languages, including some African uh, languages, but uh, also French, uh, Spanish, uh, other European uh, languages that might be uh, required. And finally, Hong Kong, in terms of um, disputes with Chinese parties, Hong Kong has a mutual arrangement with China on uh, enforcement of uh, interim uh, court ordered interim measures for the arbitration. And that really is important for parties who uh, wish to go after assets located in China. Hong Kong is the only jurisdiction to have that uh, mutual arrangement. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much, Olga. So we have a few a few questions, uh, all directed at uh, Julia. We have we have two questions that touch upon the the, the, the same topic, which is you, you said you said earlier that uh, the KJAC rules contain some of the KJAC rules contain specificities borrowed from from Chinese rules and 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 Chinese aspects to which reassure which should reassure Chinese investors. W would you like to give concrete examples of, of those? Yes, thank you. Um, but the, the, the KJAC rules, the very first draft was actually based on the uh, Shenzhen, the Court of International Arbitration Rules. So it was based on uh, those rules that we, we made the first draft. And then after that, the, the six um, partners have had uh, a lot of discussions and um, um, considerations and amendments of the different uh, various clauses, and then made the decision of which ones should be um, according to the local rule, um, for instance, like emergency arbitrator, it's very difficult for a uniform rules to say how that emergency arbitrator should work. Um, but um, uh, I saw the question, uh, let me just say, for, for instance, um, what was borrowed from the Chinese rule, I think is the, the inquisitorial kind of uh, approach that because in South Africa, if the parties say they want to argue the, the matter and they believe that it will take them two weeks to argue the matter, the South African arbitrator will say, yes, okay, I agree. Uh, you believe the parties will take two weeks, it will be two weeks. But in, in the new KJAC rules, the tribunal has uh, more power to say, I don't think you need two, two weeks. I think uh, according to your written submission, three days more than enough. 
you know, um, that, that type of thing. So the tribunal does have that power to, to say to the parties, cut it short and, you know, so uh, procedurally, that is, that is just one uh, example. Um, and also um, like um, the, the parties, um, as I said just now, the parties can actually agree in the, um, um, in, in the agreement as the, uh, the language to use. And um, if they want to use the, the um, Chinese language, they can. And we have a, a, a joint panel where each um, partner institutions will um, nominate um, certain amount of arbitrators and then we put them all in a joint panel. So for the parties to choose the, the arbitrators, we don't like let them nominate just like from um, Anyway, we will give them the list of the, the panelists and they, the parties, will, they, they can make their own um, choice from that panel. And the um, default, um, we, we said that is three arbitrators panel. So it basically means the Chinese party can have a Chinese arbitrator and then uh, the, the African party can have an African arbitrator. And then um, it's either the institution or the, the parties all the two party nominated arbitrators will, will find a chair. And we also have in this panel, we will have a neutral panel. So the panels nominated by the, the six KJEC uh, parties will stay on the main panel. And then we will also uh, nominate a neutral panel, which means the arbitrators coming from other jurisdictions uh, out of China and Africa. And uh, with that, we, we hope that if it's a sole arbitrator, we probably find a a neutral arbitrator or if it's a chair. Uh, it's just to um, comfort some of the Chinese investors concept that African, Africa is actually one country. They, they sometimes don't even feel comfortable if um, the South African party choose a Kenya arbitrator. They'll probably still feel that you are all Africans and you probably, you know, pro-Africa or whatever. So those are some of the differences that um, in the, the KJEC rules. And um, um, I think that that hopefully that answers question one and two. And for the third question that I can see here, that um, yes, that the parties will have to agree to uh, institute it. It's quite important because according to the Chinese Arbitration Act, those institutions, they have to, um, they cannot really register, that's my understanding, they can't uh, easily register a KJEC center. So the KJEC is under the auspices of uh, SHIAC, BIAC, and uh, SKIA. So their model clause is not going to say, uh, directly say KJEC rules. I don't know, they are still uh, deciding on their model clause because KJEC is not a center there. KJEC is just one of the, the project or um, can call it a project or, or just one set of rules. They will probably say submit to, for instance, BIAC to be administered in terms of the KJEC rules, something like that. But um, for Johannesburg, we, we, it's, it's easier, much easier to just register a nonprofit uh, organization and you can say submit to KJEC Johannesburg. That, so it's, it's two different type of clause. And when a clause doesn't really include uh, a specific KJEC center's name, that we have a KJEC guiding committee, we have to make a decision. And um, we, we probably will consider where it's closer with I mean, the, the dispute or the parties, where is the closer seat or which center is more convenient to handle that? Um, because wherever it is, it will be the same set of rules except for a few um, local rules. And it will be more or less the same cost uh, unless, um, I mean, the, the local um, institutions do have a say in the cost as well to just adjust to different uh, exchange rates and things. Um, but yes, it, it's actually, I would say, it's quite important for the parties to um, make clear which, which KJEC uh, center um, they are using. But um, I'm sure the Chinese partners, they will um, let us know what their model calls that they would like to use. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, with that, I think, Andrew, uh, we need to conclude that very interesting sessions, although that could go all day. Uh, it was very insightful. I, I introduced the, the, the session. Would you like to conclude the, the session? Absolutely. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to conclude by thanking our excellent panel. I think, uh, as, as we anticipated, you've brought a wealth of experience and expertise with you and some very interesting and insightful um, views on, on, how to, on the, how to take this forward and the sort of the future for African arbitration. Um, as Julia said, you know, it's, the future is education um, and hopefully this has contributed to that discussion and uh, we have the opportunity to continue it together in the future. Thank you also to our attendees. Um, there, there are a lot of you, I hope you found it interesting. Uh, please do feel to feel free to follow up with any other questions that you that may occur to you um, after the webinar. Back to you, Tom. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you to to Delos and Panda for organising this. And uh, with that, I think uh, uh, the only thing, but very important thing, that remains to do is to wish you all either a good evening or a, a nice day. Goodbye.